May is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and tonight we're taking a close look at what some are calling Asian hate. Through our ongoing series, The Talk, we try to have the tough conversations about race, and tonight, Tan Trung takes up discrimination against Asian Americans and why some conservatives feel they're being unfairly blamed for racial tension. None of us got to choose our race when we came into this world, but racism is a choice. How we treat people who may look different from us the words that come out of our mouth, the stuff that we post online. We get to choose if any of that comes across as racist. Tonight, we're going to focus on what many call Asian hate, how some people understand it, and perhaps more importantly, how we push back against it. Well, I think, you know, having the term microaggressions helps because those have always existed. When my daughter walked the dog, and uh, a six years old girl just sent out a saying, are you a dog eater? My real name is Crystal, but even when I introduce myself, people don't want to accept that that's my name. We'll be discussing race and identity with four women. I am Angel Chung Kutno. My American name is Barbara Weaver. So my name is Crystal Yuan Zhang. That's my full name. Uh, I am a doctor here at Tulane. Uh, in the section of infectious diseases. Cynthia Lee Shang, Jefferson Parish president. All have a shared pride in their Asian heritage. My heritage is Chinese. My parents uh, immigrated from China. I was born in the US um, and uh, raised in Virginia. I was born in Vietnam to a Vietnamese mother and an American father. And I was raised in a multicultural home. My father is black. My mom's an immigrant from Korea. Angel Chung Kutno's interests and talents are an extension of her diverse upbringing. She's a piano playing, Mardi Gras Indian beating poet. She recently wrote an untitled piece about being biracial. One part touches on her childhood. Did you hear all the time someone called my mom Chinese and said, all Asians are the same? Did you notice when we went to serve other communities, I looked more like them than anyone in our youth group? Yet y'all were quick to assure me, you're not really black. She now considers herself an Afro-Asian for justice. I mean, it defines everything that I do. From the murder of George Floyd to the attacks on Asian Americans, Chung Kutno says this past year cuts to the core of who she is. The pain was just continuous for me. And in one way, it did feel as if I had to shift my energy from the black community to the Asian community. Barbara Weaver's biracial experience is different. I personally don't fear being stopped by police officers. So I don't have that. I don't have that. But what I do have is go back to where you came from. You speak perfect English. You don't have Asian eyes and nose. Uh, I'm going to burn your, I should have burned your village down. Weaver says her first time conversations with strangers usually start like this. Well, their initial question is, where are you from? And I said, well, um, I'm originally, originally from Oregon and I moved to Louisiana about a dozen years ago. No, where are you really from? Where are you really from? That's something many Asian Americans would consider a microaggression because they feel it singles them out. I can't imagine what the response would be if I was to ask a white American this, where are you from? Where are you really from? For certain Americans, it's just understood. They're from here. Despite being born in the US, Dr. Crystal Zhang finds herself constantly explaining where she's from. Doing so, she says, has a cumulative effect. There is definitely always this feeling that yeah, you're a foreigner. Zhang wrote about that feeling in this opinion for the nonprofit, nonpartisan newsroom, The Lens. She described a dangerous confrontation two fellow doctors had with an armed man near her office last April. The incident that um, I had written about in my op-ed that happened here at Tulane, um, that like really shook me because um, you know, someone pointing a gun at people and saying, are you Chinese or Japanese? If you are, then I'm gonna kill you. I really felt like I was fearing for my physical safety and even, even my life. The suspect then lifted his shirt to show a gun in his waistband, but eventually walked away. There's no video of that encounter, but you may have seen these clips. In the last year, in different parts of the country, Asian Americans have been attacked, seemingly for no reason. Reports of Asian discrimination in the U.S. increased sharply after the pandemic began. And then finally, um, what happened in Atlanta happened. 
back in March, authorities arrested this man after they say he opened fire at three different Asian spas in Atlanta. Eight people were killed, six of whom were women of Asian descent. The suspects said the shootings were not racially motivated. Here's what investigators say he admitted to. He had a sex addiction, had visited some of the spas in the past, and that they were a temptation he, quote, wanted to eliminate. Dr. Zeng says that so-called explanation is layered with racism and sexism. But people are failing to realize that even if it is due to his sex addiction, the root cause of that is the fetishization of what Asian women and, and therefore is racism. Atlanta prosecutors say the mass shooting is a hate crime, but the motive remains a point of public debate. To many Asian Americans, though, the fact that the businesses targeted were Asian and the majority of people killed were Asian women is enough for them to speak up about the fear, anger, and frustration within their community. Asians are invisible in this country. The only time that you know Asian exists is when there's a pandemic or a war. We are Asian Americans. Earlier this spring, local Asian Americans held a rally at City Park. They called attention to what they feel is growing anti-Asian sentiment, but it also seemed to be an effort to show their patriotism. We as Asian Americans love being Americans and want to be treated as such. We can't live in a society where because of what you look like, that makes you the enemy. Cynthia Lee Shang says as a young girl, she was aware that she was different, but it didn't overwhelm her. It was always that way for me. Um, what made me feel different more than that was that my dad was the sheriff. Um, so that was, you know, a difference. Before he died in 2007, Harry Lee was sheriff of Jefferson Parish for almost 30 years. He had a reputation for being tough on crime. At home, Lee Sheng says he taught her to toughen up. I remember going home and telling my father, like, you know, someone made fun of me because I was Chinese and thinking my dad was going to come save the day, call the principal, um, you know, be my hero, so to speak. And he just kind of looked at me and he laughed. And it was just like I was shocked. That was the opposite reaction that I thought he would have. And he just kind of said, you let, you let that little kid bother you? You know, and he just later in life, I remember that story because without teaching me that lesson directly, he was teaching me that lesson of you, you don't give people that power over you. Li Sheng is the first Asian American and the first woman to hold the office of Jefferson Parish president. Even in that position, she can't speak for an entire race or ethnicity. In a similar vein, Li Sheng says the hateful actions or words by individuals should not represent a broader group and certainly not the country. You can, as an Asian person, see these things that are going around in the community and withdraw in and look at the worst of people. You have to find the best people out there and interact with them. Like the issue itself, conversations about race are complicated. To some conservatives, the protests, rallies, and reckonings from the past year are part of cancel culture, an attempt to silence certain language, behavior, and political beliefs. Yes, the Caucasians are, yes. We are, being, we are being racially profiled as well. Tina of New Orleans reached out to us after we invited viewers to take an online survey on race, which also left room for people to share their opinions. Tina says there's no easy remedy for the racism that's taken place. I'm sincerely sorry that the Native Americans were stolen from, that people of color were slaves and treated so despicably. Now, Asian people are being racially profiled. All of that being said, I'm not responsible for it, so stop blaming me for the past. Through the survey, we encouraged people to leave us a voice message. This woman's message lasted more than four minutes. We're going to play portions of it. We are leaning toward becoming a racist country again by uplifting certain races and pushing down others instead of treating all races equally. I think that the race issue has only gotten worse since we've been pushing a narrative that white people are racist. Um, and I think that race relations have only gotten worse because of the fact that we keep pushing the fact that America's racist when it's not. I think people deny that racism exists because they don't want to have to stand face to face with their privilege. Without clear consensus on what is the problem, 
The conversation about Asian hate and the larger one about race continues. Our conversation with Chung Kutno ends with her reading the final verse of her poem, which captures the personal nature of something that can affect countless people. So when you say, we treated you just like our other friends, in trying to make me not feel different, you unknowingly denied my difference, and your colorblindness erased the fullness of who I am. So I mourn our friendship because you never truly saw me behind the mask. Tom Trung, Eyewitness News. And if you'd like to take our online survey on race, we'll have a link to, to it on our website. Now, we invite you to share your opinions as we continue to look at racial issues and their impact in our community.